again, it's Jonathan Hall. I'm going to uh, I am joined again by Nicholas and by uh, 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 the team from Columbus State. Let me go over today what we're going to briefly be discussing. Uh, in addition to the overviews, we're going to do a brief over. I will provide a brief overview of focus areas uh, and sort of the timeline. We're going to hand it right over to Columbus State. Columbus State's been using uh, focus areas for uh, a few years now. Has had some experience on the ground using them for uh, as they as, and they will talk about their experience both developing them and also implementing them. We're going to get a national perspective from Nicholas Hua, um, and then at the end, uh, at the end. Uh, um, We'll take questions from you all, and again, as we go along, if you'll place those questions in the chat box, that will be great. Um, so, there, so, so I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of the introduction. So. Um, if you'll pause one second, I'm going to send it out to everybody. Um, and just ask, can everyone hear audio? If you cannot hear audio, yes. Okay, so we have some people saying yes, some people saying no. Okay, great. I'm glad to hear that we've got folks on. Uh, um, so what are, what are focus areas? Focus areas are essentially a tool to help your undecided students sharpen their interests. They're there to help them decide for a student who comes into college without any real sense of what they want to do, without a, a, a strong sense of what program or what, what path they want to follow. It helps them to sort out within larger areas to narrow down their focus. So it's sort of the chicken or beef question as opposed to do you want to be a clinical psychologist or do you want to be a, a, a practical uh, statistician. They are aligned with existing programs of study. So that's an important element too. That the uh, the programs of study um, uh, that that these are these are sort of they, they roll up into if you will focus area the programs of study will roll up into one or more uh, ex uh, focus areas. So there's not you're not creating uh, a new element. You can see that on the right that they're not independent programs. They're not new majors, but they are simply a way of organizing the existing programs you have in such a way that the student can make sense of their choices. Uh, and, and pursue towards their degree. They are generally supported by both the, the curricular activity, the coursework on campus, as well as the uh, co-curricular work on your campus. Um, so things like meetings and, and clubs, but also anything as, uh, as far afield as lectures and film series, trips to uh, external air, to, to outside resources. Um, this is a way for a student to aid both in their exploration and discernment of what they, what they are interested in pursuing. What they are not, and importantly what they are not, um, are independent programs. They're not distinct. You do not major in a focus area. Students do not pursue a focus area as their, as their uh, academic career. They are used in general. You'll see them used for, I would assume, the first year. They would not be uh, something you would see somebody in beyond that. They may actually only last for a first term. They're not new majors. They're not programs that go through program review. They are, like I said, they're collections of existing programs on your campus. Um, and they are substitutes or preliminaries. They are not substitutes or preliminaries for program choice. If a student comes in wanting to be in a program, they should be allowed to be in that program. Um, but they are a way of helping students who do not know what, is, what their program will be um, to, to make sense of their, of, of their choices. So on your campus, so, so understand what this is. So by fall 2018, we, would, we expect all campuses will have defined their focus areas. By and large, having looked at the momentum year uh, implementation plans, most campuses are either well on their way or have already completed this step um, and are simply having these things reviewed. So by fall 2018, we expect them to be in, 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 in hand. We do not expect them to be in place. We expect by fall 2019, that is a year from this coming fall, that there will be no students enrolled as undeclared or undecided. They will instead be perhaps exploratory in a focus area. Um, and that, I'm going to get to that in just a second, but you will have all students will be placed into a, study, a program of study, they'll have a program, or they'll be placed into a focus area. Now, um, we're giving this time period, this year-long lag, because we are expecting that this will be something that will be actually documented in the student information, in student information system. We had communication, we had a conversation actually just yesterday with the folks at Banner 
to talk about how this gets done. We want it to be done in a business practice that is consistent across all campuses so that we are able to see it. It's also a way to support it across all campuses, so there will be a, 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 a a means by which you will be able to record within that student's record so that people who need to see it are able to see it and to support your work, um, their focus area selection. And that is really the reason we're waiting a full year. They are actually available to be used, like I said, this year. Many campuses already have, have developed them. A handful of campuses use them. Um, and it's just simply a matter of we're waiting for the technology to catch up. But we do expect by fall 2019 that technology will be in place if, uh, and, and will be able to be used. So, on an application, and this is something we've gotten a lot of questions for, undecided can remain as an option for applicant that is acceptable as an option for an applicant on an application. Um, having said that, if, a, um, if an applicant indicates that they, are, uh, that they are undecided or they're coming in undeclared, the expectation would be that something will happen to that student or for that student or with that student prior to or at the very latest at orientation so that they are able to select their focus area so that a student is not registering for classes without an idea of what courses they take. And this is critically important because as we have learned, math in particular and getting on the right math is a very important step. And for students who are not heading into STEM fields, if they come in undeclared, we would still have to, uh, from a, we would still end up placing them in college algebra perhaps, whereas if they end up being in a humanities or an arts program where that is not appropriate math, we would place them in the more appropriate math for them. So understanding what their focus area is is important for that, but it's also important for all of their course selection. And that's really a key element of this, is that this allows them to, to develop their purpose, the focus area helps them to develop their purpose in their coursework almost immediately upon stepping foot on campus. They do not wait until they have sort of sorted out the details before they can start taking classes. And, and to sort of quote Larry Abels, it's largely a way to help them explore without helping them get lost. That these are not, these are students who will really truly be exploring their options rather than simply wandering around. So that is the, that is the, the sort of core part of focus areas. Um, the, uh, the, there'll be a, a, a you know, again, when, when students come on campus, there should be an intentional onboarding process for, the, for those students who indicate undecided information, maybe, you, you know, anything from a, uh, inventory to simple conversations about uh, disciplines with faculty members. There's a number of activities that are going on around orientation at campus that will help students to sort out their focus areas a bit more. I'm going to hand this over very briefly, uh, or very shortly, to uh, uh, folks from Columbus State. Again, we have Tina Butcher. Uh, Pat McHenry, Melissa Young, and Barbara Hunt, and I am going to drag this down if I can find them. Ba -ba -ba. So give me a second. I'm trying to. I've got a list of all of you. This is quite a popular webinar, but it does mean that I've got a very limited. I've got to find my presenter list. I'm failing that. Do you have our audio, Jonathan? I have your audio. I don't have the video. So who's the login on this? Columbus State. It's uh, it should say Columbus State. Oh, I see State now. University. Yeah. All right. A little technical difficulty. I see you now. Cancel. All right. I just found you. And dropped it on you. And changed presenters. Okay. Sorry about the delay, folks. It took me a second to find. Our next presenters in a room full of people. <laughs> so now, Columbus State, you should have control. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay. My name is Barbara Hunt, and I'm at Columbus State University. In 2013, the associate provost asked me to develop some meta majors 
uh, and I worked with another advisor at the time to develop those. She did not tell us which areas. So we picked five areas that we thought covered most of the majors on campus in case someone came in undecided in what they wanted to major in. We would have uh, maps developed for the first year of their programs so that they would not lose any credits. We wanted to be very careful that any, any courses we put in here would in fact apply to the major programs that we had already developed. We developed major program maps for all the majors on campus. So this was after we had done that. We had five areas that we picked, business, computer science, math or science, education, which included STEM education, exploratory, and social sciences. The easiest of these five to develop were in fact business, exploratory, and social sciences. The computer science, math or science took a little bit more negotiating as did the education, but we were able to develop them. Since then, we've developed three more, but I want to concentrate right now on the, t the first five, the ones that we had originally developed in 2014. We did not call them meta majors, however. We thought meta major did not convey to the student what these were. Instead, we used the term interest area. Since then, the state of Georgia prefers the term focus area. Uh, how did we develop the meta majors or interest focus areas? We started with two seasoned advisors. Your campus might do two or three, depending on the number of focus areas you want to develop. Do not start with a committee. A committee will bog down the process tremendously. If you've got some advisors who know how to advise a, a variety of majors, you can accomplish the, the first draft with just a couple of good advisors who know what they're doing. You can then show that draft to stakeholders across your university. The next thing that these two or three advisors need to do is decide on what focus areas or interest areas they want to develop, or maybe your provost will tell you which ones. You can also look on the Complete College Georgia website for a visual that suggests possible focus areas. Uh, we did that recently when we developed the next three on our list so that we now have eight focus areas. Uh, you could go ahead and look at that site to get you some ideas on which areas you want to develop. We then assigned to each of the advisors which areas to develop. I took three of them. The other advisor took two of them. After we developed what we thought were great drafts, we showed them to each other. We made some corrections and changes, agreed on our versions, and then sent them out to the various stakeholders on campus such as advising centers, department chairs, key faculty, associate deans, and so on. We got back a lot of feedback. A lot of the folks just said, hey, it looks great. <laughs> but a lot of them wanted us to tweak this or tweak that, and we did. Uh, we incorporated the feedback into the final versions of the maps. And right now I'm going to show you two of those versions, two of those maps. First one is a business interest area map. This is the original 2014 map, not the revised one that Dr. McHenry is going to talk to you about. Uh, all of the, our maps, all of these original five, had the Area A courses. We had both Englishes and a math in the first year of this map. Remember, these maps cover only two semesters. And, uh, we thought we were being very, very innovative at the time to include two interest areas. So of the business map, we included two business classes. Today, if you're creating these maps, you'll want to include three such courses, if at all possible, in order to get the momentum year overlay of courses in the interest area. But at the time, in 2014, we thought we were being very clever <laughs> to put in two classes that specifically helped students to, to take a class in the business area and help them decide whether this is, in fact, what they wanted to do. It's very important to include classes that will count toward the major if they decide to major in business, for example, 
we wanted to make sure all the classes would count. If they decide to change and move to something else quite different, let's say social, social sciences or English or something like that, most majors, at least at Columbus State University, have elective credits. Only a few do not. So we were felt pretty safe in exploring these two courses in the business interest area. Moving on to the next slide, I wanted to show you the exploratory map. This one was a little more difficult to develop. It meant this was a more positive wording of the undeclared major. Somebody who truly had no idea what they wanted to major in. Uh, so we were we listed all the math courses. We listed both English classes. We put in mostly classes that would apply to any major, but we did notice toward the bottom on the left and the right an area F class of their choosing. So let's suppose they were, might have been interested in a science major, they could choose something from an area F biology major, let's say. Or they could choose an area F class that might apply to criminal justice or psychology in the spring semester wanted to give them some choices here if they truly had no idea what it is they wanted to major in but wanted to explore the possibility of a couple of majors. Okay, I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. McHenry who's going to talk to you about the current program maps. Uh, yes, yeah, so as Barbara mentioned, we redesigned the original five maps and we added three more. Uh, one of the reasons we we added three and came up with a total of eight is that we align every major that we offer at the university with at least one focus area. And we put those majors right at the um, header of, of each map as you can as you can see up there. And in all cases we um, we tried to follow three principles and that is um, have the students complete area A, English and Math in the first year, get them in the right math class, and, give, and then give them meaningful exposure to the discipline with three courses, as, as, uh, as Barbara said. So this is easy in some cases, not so easy in others. Uh, if we look at business, for example, uh, business is pretty easy. So here's the English and Math, Area A. Here's the Aligned Math class. All the business majors take algebra, so simple enough. And then business has a common Area F. And so it's easy to identify three courses that contribute to those majors and give them a meaningful experience uh, in the business major. So, piece of cake in, in that one. In humanities, um, which we, we thought would be easy to do, but it was unexpectedly uh, difficult and it called for some compromises. Um, if you look at Area A and the Aligned Math course, that, that part's easy. Uh, uh, and, we, and you'll notice there that we give a specific suggestion for the math course, even though there are other possibilities. But we think that, that helps us cut down on the confusion that the student might have. If they're really going into humanities, then quantitative skills is a very good course for them to take. The compromises came in the third principle, and that is providing a meaningful meaningful exposure to those uh, to these disciplines because there's not a course that's common to to all of them and some of these majors don't really have a course that's available to students in the first year so in English for example there's really not a literature course that's available to students who haven't completed English 1102 and so therefore it wouldn't appear uh, wouldn't appear on this map uh, to to deal with that, what we did, we, we made the first year kind of humanities heavy, you might say. We uh, prompted them to, to get in the foreign language uh, sequence right away, because all of these majors require foreign language. And then at the bottom of the chart, we uh, prompt them to choose, that is the bottom of the second semester, we prompt them to choose a course that's at least uh, more closely associated with the major. Than the, core, than the regular core courses in most cases. And notice too that we added, added in um, that issues in education course for those who are interested in teaching. So they get some exposure to uh, teacher education 
if they want to, if they choose that. Fine performing, performing arts um, had all those problems and, and one of its own uh, to, to add. So with our arts, court, arts majors, the uh, additional challenge was that these require an audition or a portfolio to get into it. So we don't have very many students who come to CSU um, and hover around these majors without being accepted into them, without intentionally com coming to the university to, to, uh, to go into one of the programs. But nonetheless, it's, it's possible. And you can see what we have here is just the last row on the chart. And we, asked, we did identify some courses that, uh, I guess kind of ironically, that are available to non-majors in those disciplines, but that give them an exposure uh, to the major. And also we added in the teacher education courses because a lot of the students in art, music, or theater uh, end up going into teacher education or start out going into teacher education for certification. And so we added those in uh, as one of the meaningful ways to participate in the major. Education is another one. It, it also comes with its own, uh, you know, its own challenge. In this case, uh, like the other ones, the Area A English is easy to get in there, and the meaningful exposure in this case is very easy because all the education majors, once we pushed secondary education out to the content discipline, so we pushed that out of this focus area, but once we did that, then it's easy to get them into the um, um, courses in education uh, and, and give them that exposure. So the hard part is math. because because education, in education, some students go in sort of a math science direction and some don't. And so to deal with that, we had to come up with a kind of a compromise statement there in the, in the green, both in the first semester and the second semester, to get them on the right track. So that was not going into math science. We suggest the quantitative reasoning course. That was going into math science, we put them on the algebra calculus track, and we assume that students probably know, even in their first semester, whether they want to go in those, uh, what direction they want to go in those two cases. Okay, and I'm going to turn you over to Melissa Young from our uh, Center for, uh, uh, for Academic Advising Center, mm -hmm. and, uh, and she'll tell us about what we're going to do to uh, implement these further. Okay. Um, me first or you first? Okay. So um, as Pat mentioned, um, we are kind of moving forward with um, changing some of our current processes. We've always used those focus areas or interest areas that Barbara has developed, but now that we're moving into the momentum year, we are kind of revising some of those. And Tina was going to speak to you about the admission and institutional research piece, and then I'll come back on and speak about that advising piece. Okay. Um, thanks, Melissa. Although we implemented the interest or the focus areas a few years ago, um, and they've been used by advisors in, in our Academic Center for Excellence, or the area we call ACE, Students have continued to be able to select undeclared as their major when they come to CSU. So we've been using the, the focus areas with them, um, but we haven't been able to track um, them officially um, in Banner. And so to that end, um, we are looking forward to being able to use Banner um, to when, when students apply to be, uh, to associate them with that particular focus area family. And so we will be updating our admission application so that it will continue to include our regular majors like it always has, but then rather than undeclared, what we'll have is an item that says, um, I'm still in the process of deciding on my major. So if a student selects that option, then it will open up another area um, with the list of focus areas from which they can select. And so um, then we'll have a better idea of whether or not they want to go into one of the broader focus areas or if they are truly exploratory and, have, and are unable to decide at that point, 
they can select that area and then that will automatically trigger some additional intervention and activities from our advising center, our career center, and our counseling center. Um, additionally, uh, students also complete a survey prior to attending orientation that helps, that allows us to pre-register them before they come on campus. Um, and so we're going to be in the process of updating this survey as well so that it mirrors those same choices and so that advisors can appropriately pre-register those students into the right courses um, and have additional conversations with them either before they come to campus or when they arrive on campus. One of the other things that we will have to do in the communication area is um, and I think our advisors understand this, but in the professional advising centers that um, help everyone understand that the, um, the program maps in the focus areas are not necessarily a lockstep process. You will have students who come in with different um, dual enrollment credit or AP or IB credit. And so um, we will have to rely on the advisor's expertise and their communication with the students to make accommodations for what the students actually bring in. Um, so having the students select a focus area and having them coded appropriately in Banner is going to allow our advisors to develop some very strategic communication campaigns um, that will communicate to the students some targeted information about activities that are related to their majors um, in the selected focus areas. And so um, additionally, having them identified as in different focus areas is going to also allow us to better able, be un, able to understand how students change or migrate from a focus area to a specific major within that area, possibly. Or maybe they go completely outside of all of the majors that were in that focus area and change to something completely different. So it'll give us some information about trends, how students um, move either within focus areas or outside of them as they progress. Um, our student retention specialist in the Academic Center for Excellence will be responsible for advising all of our students who select focus areas, and they have been doing this for some years now um, as the students have been coded as undeclared. And so Melissa works with, uh, she's the assistant director in the Academic Center for Excellence, and she's going to share with you a little bit more about how they do this. Yes, so as Tina mentioned, we have all of our first year students who are coming to campus complete that advising survey. And this survey facilitates pre-registration. Students communicate a desired schedule regarding, you know, time, potential conflicts such as sports, a job they may have. And our goal is that no student comes to orientation without having been pre-registered according to their focus area or program, program map as indicated on their application. Um, what we are going to do going forward is kind of add an additional layer of support for our incoming students by making our advisors more available to students prior to orientation. In the past years, um, students meet with their advisors during orientation and don't really have a lot of communication on the front end. Um, those in the focus areas in particular will receive additional um, intentional contact early on as they begin to think about choosing their desired major from that focus area category. We do have dedicated advisors for our focus areas and our exploratory students. Um, they will receive additional training so that they can refine their practice with their students to kind of scaffold our advising into other areas of support, such as that career center and counseling center that Tina mentioned. Um, these will be, you know, in addition to those meaningful conversations with their academic advisor, these offices are able to provide additional career advising and counseling along with some interest inventory, <laughs> um, such as the PAN skills assessment and the strong interest assessment. These help students as they begin to make more purposeful choices in their first years and help them understand what their strengths and weaknesses are and where they might do well. And I think Pat and Burnett, is that right? Mm -hmm. No, are we done? And there's a link on this slide to our current program map. Um, and then we will have the, the new program maps that we are implementing and probably all of the revised versions hosted by May 1st, 2000. 
So we'll turn it back over to Jonathan. Thanks for that. And I'm going to, there's a, a question that came in the chat box, if I can ask, get you all to answer it real quick. Um, and uh, Francisco, I'm sorry I sent it to you. I tried to send it to Columbus. <laughs> I have a little trouble with WebEx this morning. Um, how do you handle the, the financial, what's the financial aid issues around that? I mean, uh, is there, have you come across financial aid complications with this? Um, can you sort of speak to that? That's come up a couple of times about students being not in programs that lead to a degree. Um, can you speak to that? We have not encountered anything as long as they are undeclared, and it's, it's our understanding that they can remain in that category until they reach 30 hours at which time they do have to declare um, a major. And so we have not experienced an issue on our campus with that. Fantastic, thanks. I'm gonna hand this over now to Nicholas Huot um, and make him the presenter. Nicholas, if you're ready, uh, it's coming your way. The ball is shifting. Nicholas Huot, again, is a, is a former G Georgia State University staffer, but he's uh, now uh, uh, ensconced up in Indianapolis with the Complete College America team. Um, Nicholas brings to us a, sort of a national perspective as well as a deep experience with, with the work. So, Nicholas, you have the calm, as it were. Okay. Uh, do you, I think you see me. Uh, let me see if uh, I might see me, but uh, hear me. I don't know. Uh, let me see. I don't see your your uh, slides yet, but that may just be a, a delay in the. I think you see me now, uh, but not my slide. Yeah. Let's see. Um... A brief blast of Nicholas Huot. <laughs> yes. From Probably sunny... well worth coming logging on to this morning, actually. <laughs> uh, let me see here. I've seen blanks. So I think it's coming. Yeah, I think it's... So there's a question that came on uh, for, uh, in the interim. Uh, will do we incorporate the focus area into Banner? Uh, that is a conversation we uh, we have been engaged in with with the Banner people. That yes, indeed, uh, uh, Columbus, if you're still on phone, you currently don't have it in Banner. Is that correct? All right, so they have not come on up, but Nicholas, we see you now, so we'll go ahead and move forward with that. Okay, you, you do see my presentation, not my this, uh, desktop? Yep, so I see your application. Thanks. So we'll take it over from here, Nicholas. Perfect. So, uh, well, yeah, you see my face now. Uh, so like uh, Jonathan said, um, I'm currently Strategy Director at Complete College America in Indianapolis. Um, prior to this, I was at Georgia State University overseeing the first year programs, mostly uh, learning communities, uh, meta majors, um, and, and uh, a bunch of other programs that we have dedicated specifically for first year and incoming students. Uh, as uh, Jonathan said, and obviously Columbus uh, State also shared, uh, I, I will slip in and out between meta majors, focus areas, interest areas. Uh, to me, uh, obviously I'm not speaking for Complete College Georgia here, uh, the name is not as important. Obviously, it has to be pretty um, homogenous on your campus and make sure everybody uses the same language. Um, but during this presentation, you will hear me talk about focus areas, meta majors. Uh, I mean the same thing both uh, every time, so uh, let's not worry about this. Uh, so quite clearly, again, what are they? Uh, just to reemphasize what Jonathan said, they're basically a group of majors that fit under an umbrella, uh, under a same discipline or career pathways. One thing that's very important, of course, is that they share at least the first year of courses, where the curriculum courses, the requirements, at least the preferences, are very similar. So as you see at least here, uh, for the business-focused areas, everything that fits under that bucket would be the pre-major um, in, in, uh, in under the college, or under the pathway. One thing, uh, if you're already kind of thinking, of, well, how do I organize this? You can look at uh, different models. One of them are the career pathways. You can look at the, um, at the back end, what our students are interested in pursuing. 
You could also look by overall disciplines, such as the social sciences, business, education, and so on and so forth. One way you can also look at it, uh, start looking at it at least, is with your structure of your school. Uh, look at the colleges that you currently have at your institution and group the majors that those different colleges are offering. Chances are you're going to find um, meta majors or focus areas that fit very well already on there. So start with that and then let's look, and that's very important, let's look at the degree maps of those different majors. They should share uh, similar, very similar uh, characteristics in terms of core courses, in terms of uh, math pathways, and in terms of lab sequences. If they don't, then either you know the, the major does not really fit under that umbrella, or it may be necessary uh, to potentially change the degree maps so that it aligns a little bit better. One thing I would, uh, again, reemphasize, focus areas, creating focus areas does not re you know, require um, any curriculum change in general. It uh, does not require to add any courses or anything like this. The focus areas should be somewhat clear um, on your end, at least on how to, what categories they fall under. So again, why, why focus areas? And, and uh, th this is not just a, a Georgia uh, concept, by the way. Uh, this is uh, going across uh, the country quite clearly. So why the focus area? Well, one of them is that students who are starting their careers in college tend to be faced with a lot of choices. Uh, a lot of them may have clear major ideas when they come in. It's like, I want to be a psychology major or political science or whatever it is. But a lot of times, even then, when they apply to your school, they will see 40, 50, 60, 90 degree options that they need to choose from. And that can be quite daunting for an 18 year old. And that either makes them start questioning themselves or just you know, totally be overwhelmed in general. Uh, so having from 90, going from 90 degree programs to simple seven or eight focus area makes a lot more sense. It makes things a little bit easier on their end and basically also helps, and I'll talk about that later on, in terms of scheduling and major choices and so on and so forth. Uh, and one thing that you need to also keep in mind is that while we may know what those programs are, we may know where those majors lead to in terms of career pathways, an 18-year-old does not really know this. And they also tend to, let's be honest, uh, romanticize some options in terms of majors and careers. You know, they're big fans of um, Mad Men. Well, then obviously I want to be in marketing not really understanding what it takes and what is it the you know what you need to go into uh, marketing uh, they, they have this uh, this grand idea of what it is but they don't quite know in terms of uh, the next four years what it entails so uh, or, or is it really are they really even well suited for this so getting the, the focus area helps with the element of choice it helps also to bring the students along and provide good information about this as Columbus mentioned also again, the focus areas and especially when you align the degree maps and make sure that it, the focus areas mirrors the degree maps of the majors in the meta majors and focus area, help ensure the students take the classes that they need in order to progress towards their degree and their majors. So it's super important of course that students take the right classes and are well advised. So the advisor in this case play a, uh, a crucial role in helping the students not just uh, choosing the appropriate focus major, uh, focus area and meta major, but the right courses that count towards their degree. And if they happen to choose to change majors between you know, uh, the meta major, that they're not um, taking additional unnecessary classes. Uh, if they choose, they go from uh, marketing to accounting, all the classes ideally that they have taken the first year would still count toward their degree, but also towards their major. So that is uh, very important in that, that aspect of it. And I think probably the, the most important part of it for a focus area is really allow the university and the college to create interventions and outreach programs to help the students pick a major 
an informed decision. Uh, whether it happens from the get-go, from uh, you know the students are admitted to college, uh, right after they're admitted to have that kind of conversation with advisor, with career counselors, to really inform them about what does it mean to be a, uh, a business major, whether it's accounting, finance, real estate, whatever it is, and get, again, a, an informed and deliberate decision so that once they make a clear uh, choice into this is the major that I want to pursue, that it is, you know, it is done so in an informed decision and that they're more inclined to stay with that major. And again, the, the, it reduced the major changes after the first year because for the first year, they really have, you are really receiving uh, a lot of information about what does it entail the next four years or two years, what does it entail once you graduate, what are the career possibilities, and they get a good understanding uh, rather than simply saying, well, I'm going to be a psychology major because that's what I know. Um, so it's really important, again, having a clear decision and reduce major changes. We'll talk about reducing the time to degree, reduce the amount of resources and loans that the students need to take in order to graduate, and quite frankly, uh, supporting the student and providing good uh, information for the student also helps students who may feel a little bit defeated or purposeless because they keep changing majors every semester and they feel like, well, college maybe is not for me. I don't really know where I fit in with this. Being in a meta major, they are able to receive uh, targeted intervention from advising, from career services, where they uh, are able to hopefully get good information and uh, are, are able to understand exactly why they're in college and what they hope to accomplish once they graduate with, uh, in two or four years. Again, uh, focus areas are not a new concept. You know, uh, I'm not saying that just because it's, it's all over the country, but think about how you talk to students in general. Usually the conversation is about, well, what's your major? What are you interested in? You're basically starting, you know, uh, laying the groundwork for um, meta majors. You're already asking them, what do you want to do uh, after you graduate? So whether you start from the, uh, from the beginning as to what you're interested in or what you want to do, which is more looking at the back end of it, you're really starting conversation with students to put them in the right, um, in the right track, start them off with the right in the, in the beginning with appropriate courses, appropriate choices. So sometimes it's necessary to change uh, the question instead of saying, well, what's your major, which you'll get one word answer to what are you interested in? Uh, and then you're gonna get a really good conversation going and help that student. So one thing I would do is uh, something that Columbus State uh, mentioned as well, try to include career assessment uh, as early as possible, even before uh, ideally students get to meet with an academic advisor during orientation, uh, get them with uh, strength assessments, interest, um, you know, questionnaires, like what do they want to do? Make them start, you know, start thinking about what they uh, are interested in, what they're good at, what they want to do. So by the time that they meet with an academic advisor, they have a better understanding. If you're also able to provide good information in terms of the career options, about the labor market data. So again, more information for the students is going to help that conversation with the academic advisor. It's going to facilitate the academic advisor's job to help them with uh, a major selection, but also with make sure that they take the right classes that helps them with, um, with towards progress and uh, degree completion. One thing here, uh, hopefully you can see this a little bit. Uh, you may have seen this, this octagon. It, it, it uh, makes its round pretty much everywhere. The one thing I like about this is that the end goal for this is, is pretty clear, clear cut. Sorry about this. It is a career pathway. So the first octagon that you would see uh, the, the interior are really the focus areas and the meta majors. And then the second moves to the different majors that fall within that focus area. And then the last of the external uh, octagon includes the uh, potential jobs that and careers that the students would, uh, would wish to pursue. And in this case, even includes the 
um, potential salary that the students may get once they graduate. So that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure about the, uh, the the salary range, but again, more information is good uh, so that means the students are not graduating with like, well, I didn't think that you know I would be uh, making so little money. Uh, for, from the beginning, you want to make sure that they get the uh, the um, the information and that this information, the especially the exterior octagon, should be. Um, shared again with career services with the students throughout their career so that they don't get the surprise when they finally about to graduate and they're in their senior year. Uh, this focus area you know, uh, or, or meta major map if you will is something that uh, is a little bit more um, aligned with the college at the uh, at Georgia State University in this case. Um, so the meta majors, so Georgia State has business, health sciences, uh, arts, education, and policy studies uh, colleges. It's a little bit easier. It makes sense in terms of, you know, in terms of politics, in terms of advising structures. Uh, and then natural sciences, humanities, and social sciences fall under the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, in this case, again, it helps with the, uh, the advising structure and that are, uh, the advisors are associated with the uh, particular colleges. Uh, one thing that I like about this, uh, I like a lot of things, I quite honestly, because that's what I use, but during orientation, it's pretty easy uh, when you put that on the board so that you can basically say, hey, all my actual sciences, accounting, business, economics, finance, and so on and so forth, please come with me. We're going to meet with an academic advisor in the next room, and the academic advisor is going to talk to you about what classes fit specifically for your major and all the students at the table next to you will share the same interest. So let's start making networking decisions, let's start talking about career plans. Uh, so, But all that discussion is really centered around that particular major uh, or meta major rather. So it starts uh, really well from the, the, the get-go. The degree map, I'm not going to spend much time because um, Columbus State uh, talked about that very clearly. Uh, but this is pretty much what a first semester would look like. Uh, it follows a degree map, so all the courses that you see here are in the core curriculum. Students, uh, whether you know, this is appropriate for an accounting, a finance, a real estate, uh, pretty much any major that falls within the business area. The good thing about this, again, is that uh, if a student were to change majors from accounting to real estate to marketing, the first courses that the student has taken as part of the fo this focused area and with the help of an advisor, it counts towards the degree and towards their major. So the student is not taking unnecessary courses. They're still progressing quite nicely towards their degree. Um, and that helps a great deal. And again, one thing I want to emphasize, um, I know it may not be an option for every college, but one thing, and for uh, every school, I'm a huge fan of the first year seminar course. The first year seminar course is an amazing opportunity, not just for uh, the opportunity to talk about college success, such as uh, you know, um, critical thinking, uh, study skills, uh, communication, uh, financial literacy, which is so important, uh, note-taking strategies and so on and so forth, but it really provides a good opportunity to, especially if you uh, restrict the registration to first-year seminars to students in that particular focus area and meta majors, you have an opportunity for uh, an academic advisor to meet with the students and really talk about the next steps for next semesters. You really get an opportunity to have open houses for out-of-class activities where you have those students meet with faculty members in different departments with activities and interventions that speak specifically for that meta major. Uh, so again, I'm a big fan of first year seminars. They are great opportunities. If you don't have them, uh, I strongly recommend them. Uh, and um, there are a lot of help, again, for this as well throughout, um, uh, throughout a lot of different universities and uh, university systems. So, Last bit about the, final, uh, the, the focus areas implementation, and that is going to, uh, again, reemphasize what Columbus State mentioned earlier. Let's limit the number of focus areas. Uh, focus areas is not something, again, that you're trying to provide too many of them, 
Again, we're trying to eliminate the, um, the dilemma of choice. So you want to go about five to eight maximum focus areas so that they're clear, that the students are able to make a good decision and, uh, and understand, it should be clear. Again, what majors fit under um, the focus areas. Again, you don't want to provide them too many uh, choices because then it just muddies the water and makes things more complicated. Involve the, uh, the advisors from the get-go, whether in terms of how to select which major fit under which focus areas. Uh, if that is not possible, at least they should have a, definitely should have a seat at that table, but definitely involve the advisors and actually uh, empower the advisors to create the schedules for each meta majors and for each focus areas, from at least for the first two semesters. The, uh, the advisors have great opportunity and, and great knowledge about the different degree maps, so they're able to really sit down and design uh, what classes are required, which classes uh, and which courses are preferred based on the meta majors. So definitely advisors, who, advisors should have, uh, should be at the, at the core really of focus areas from the get-go. Uh, try to involve them as early as possible so they can start, again, having a conversation with incoming students so that they can start putting them in the right and appropriate meta majors and then make sure that they can advise them as to what the best courses they can take for their first year. Again, uh, of course, make sure that the first year courses are similar. Uh, courses uh, or meta majors that have different math pathways, that have different lab sequences or different core requirements uh, should be grouped together. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, core, uh, meta majors that have different lab sequences or math pathways perhaps need to be either revised or simply grouped in a different um, focus area. Can't stress this enough, again, with a first year seminar or if you don't have a first year seminar, trying to have uh, an outreach interventions uh, in courses potentially, if not uh, workshops, um, career assessment, major selection workshops or uh, advising sessions that are dedicated to uh, students in specific focus areas. It's going to help them, again, with career selection, with inform major selection, with time to degree, and making sure that they don't take unnecessary courses. Uh, again, it's all about information and making sure they understand uh, what they're getting themselves into and they are prepared and well equipped to uh, undertake that degree. I'm a big fan of exploratory focus area. Uh, one thing, again, you may see, well, that, that seems like a, a heavy lift really to have all these potential students in all these different areas. Think about this way. A lot of students who are undeclared uh, may not know specifically what they want to do, but a lot of cases, they know what they do not want to do. So you're going to start having that conversation about, well, what are you interested in? Are you interested in the medical field altogether? Uh, no? Okay, well, that restricts the math pathways from the get-go. So maybe quantitative reasoning is more appropriate for you. So the, the, the focus area for exploratory uh, or undeclared students is a, a good opportunity and uh, to, to really have deep conversations with the students. And if you have those students, it's really something that you want to spend a little bit more time with them and really have uh, more targeted outreach for these particular students. And again, communicate clearly the purpose of the focus areas. The, the naming strategies, you know, the, uh, the marketing should be done as early as possible. Share that on the website. Send them uh, letters, emails, texts about meta majors, about focus areas. What are they? Which, meta ma which majors fit under which meta majors? Why do we do this? We want to make sure that the students understand uh, as much as information as possible so that they make a clear decision, that they take the right classes associated with their majors, they graduate faster, um, and basically graduate with more information about their potential career. So share that, share the benefits of the focus areas with the students so that they are well equipped, again, to make an appropriate decision for their major. That's it pretty much for me. Jonathan? 
I'm going to become the presenter. So thank you both, Nicholas, uh, and and I, I'm going to miss somebody if I try and do this without my notes. But Tina and Pat, uh, Melissa and Barbara from Colum uh, Columbus State. That was a fantastic. Uh, that was a fantastic uh, overview. It, it actually uh, to say exceeded my expectations would be uh, minim would, would minimize that. Um, I would suggest if there are questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box and send them to all so we can see them all. Um, uh, I want to sort of highlight a couple things that I heard uh, that I really appreciated hearing in that is, you know, one thing uh, that, that to drive us all the way back to Columbus State is the fact that these, that when, when you start to build these out on your institution and as you build them out as an institution, it's really important that they sort of be centralized in a way, that somebody has sort of oversight and control on this. And then you get uh, you get input and feedback from the the broader group, and the, and the significance of that too is that it really does help to move the project forward. It helps with consistency. It also helps to have somebody whose eyes are looking at it across the entire institution. Um, other elements that I really you know I, I really appreciated seeing this in in the Columbus maps is the fact that English and math are embedded in there. We had the question in the chat box about math, and again I think that from a from a pathways perspective we really do encourage. Uh, we encourage you to, to get that math into the first, uh, first semester. It does help with sequences of math, so you are going to have to have, for students going into education, that may mean a more intentional conversation early about exactly where are you going in education. Um, but in general, that's, that's true and important. Um, and, then, and then, you know, finally, sort of the idea of using these as, as tools to, to push your students towards thinking about where they, where they really want to be and, and helping that, to use that to identify the students who may need the, the greatest amount of support. Um, the, uh, the, 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 last, the last note I would have um, was really that, you know, we are working on a way to record this into the student information system to get it into Banner so that you can use it sort of across the entire uh, the, the, you know, so that everyone can see it on campus. It's, it's located in a place where we can all identify it. Um, and again, we're expecting that by fall 2019 that will be available in live. Uh, looking at the chat box, I don't see anything coming in, but I'm just going to do another scan up and down. Um, oh, uh, one thing, part-time students. So here's an interesting question. Um, so, so for institutions about part-time students, uh, many of our institutions have a number of part-time students, and the question is really to make sure that you're developing uh, maps that, that suit those if you have a substantial number of students who come in as part-timers. Uh, and, and that's important because two things can happen. If you have a defaulting map, again, we suggest a fuller schedule. We started talking about the fuller schedule of uh, part-time maps where they're taking, encouraged to take three courses. Um, it allows you to get them into their core courses, their, their critical courses early. It also uh, allows them sequence on sequence to see where they're going to go. So that's, a, that's an element of that. We have a number of campuses that are working on their part-time maps. And again, if there's interest in that, go ahead and shoot a, an email to me and we'll, we'll, we'll connect you all 